So beginning with uh, Katana, as I mentioned, Katana was a student here in the faculty and started to experience really kind of chronic anxiety once she attended university. And reading some research, that's not uncommon. Uh, the number one um, cause of anxiety for university students used to actually be depression. And, and that's not the case anymore. It's now actually become anxiety. And so that's very much the case uh, for Katana. So Katana, can you talk to us a little bit about how your anxiety manifested once you started to attend university? Right, so um, knowing what I know about anxiety, I guess I've always been an, an anxious person ever since I was a little kid. Um, and I didn't know, obviously, that it was anxiety. Uh, it wasn't until about 2008, I was in third year geology and all of a sudden, I mean, I love writing exams and uh, over writing papers, believe it or not. And all of a sudden, I started throwing up. Like, I just was so scared. I didn't know what to do. Um, and I didn't understand what was happening to me. So um, now I know that they were panic attacks. So I have a panic disorder. Um, I also have social anxiety. And I also have generalized anxiety with a little bit of uh, a sprinkle of PTSD and OCD in there when those things are not managed, unfortunately. Um, so, um, out of nowhere, I would shake, I would feel nauseous, as I said, I would throw up in the middle of exams, and uh, I felt like I was going crazy. And so, from that, the symptoms progressed to school refusal for me. I just couldn't even attend school. I used to want to walk to university, and I just, you know, I would get to the Bishop Brandon Bridge, and I just couldn't even walk further. And so, it got to a point where I wasn't really able to do my homework. I couldn't read, my loss, um, my concentration was taken away from me, and to this day I still suffer with that. And, um, and at worst, I became agoraphobic, which meant that I was actually uh, homebound in my apartment for about weeks at a time, and I couldn't leave at all with my, um, with my fear. So, Can you talk a little bit, I know Dr. Unger mentioned the role of perfectionism, and then when you came to school, how perfectionism was such an important thing for you. Absolutely. So I tell people that I'm a recovering perfectionist, and uh, I have a really hard time still with it. But um, I was actually just uh, sharing um, earlier today that you know I just got into a point where um, I just don't really care anymore in terms of like I know that I'm doing really well. And I'll give you an example. Um, when it first started to sort of show up for me, uh, I wrote an exam and I talked to my professor. And I was crying. I was in his in his office and I said, oh my God, I totally bombed it, you know, I'm so sorry, and, and so on and so forth. I came back, you know, however, it took them to grade the exam, he called me and I thought, oh no, I'm in trouble. He tells me I'm one of the two students that got 100%. So that just kind of tells you the distortion um, that it tells you, the anxiety tells you as well too, so it's quite debilitating in that. And so, you know, talking about anxiety, Dr. Unger mentioned there, it's multifaceted. There are so many different causal factors um, but what do you think, having lived it, is um, the largest or the biggest misconception about anxiety? I think one of them is that people think that you could just shut it off, like a light switch. Mm -hmm. And um, having worked in anxiety now and having lived it myself, I know that you can't. Uh, it's quite debilitating, just like any other physical symptoms that you might have. Um, in fact, if it was that easy to just turn it off, anxiety disorders wouldn't be the number one mental illness um, out there, which it is. And so it's actually quite distressing how many people are sh uh, you know, showing symptoms of that as well too. And so we always say that, you know, for example, if I break my leg right now, I'm not gonna wait until every single bone in my bo body is broken in order for me to actually get help. You know, I'll get help right away. And so that's where she was you know, talking about it's really important to kind of address the situation as soon as possible. Absolutely, and, and, and you were proactive in the sense, Katana, that you access supports here at the University of Manitoba, and we do have our student accessibility services, and Dr. Unger referred to um, the psychological services that are provided in, in, in the counseling psychology area. Can you talk about, and I know they made a difference for you, what were the services that really changed um, your path? Absolutely, yeah. I was very lucky enough. My dad was a psychologist, so he was that every helps. time I had. Yeah. <laughs> that helps. But, um, but yeah, and so he was, I, right away I knew. I'm like, Dad, there's something wrong. I need to, you know, I need to do something about it. So he suggested the student accessibility services, which actually helped me out in terms of my exam accommodations. At one point, they even um, had somebody uh, taking notes down for me as well, and tutors and so forth in order for me to accomplish what I needed to accomplish. Uh, I was able to access a counselor at the um, at the counseling service as well too, which I was able to see them for a period of time in order to help uh, with it. 
Uh, there was at the time uh, an acceptance in compassion therapy or ACT therapy, I'm not Thank sure you. program if it's still available, mm -hmm. through the accessibility services as well that I was able to um, uh, access. And to this day, I use a lot of sort of examples and analogy that I learned from that um, to teach my clients. And they love some of the examples that I give from that too, which I totally love obviously and, and be able to pass that on to them. That's great. And so that brings me to our next question. So now in your professional capacity, uh, Katana works as the peer support coordinator at the Anxiety Disorders Association in Manitoba. So she, she's lived it, so now she's actually taking uh, her learning and applying it in her professional role. So can you tell me about that? Yes, so um, I get to do a lot of peer support, and currently right now we just added another peer support group at Adam, we call it Adam, and um, two of them specifically for people with lived experience with anxiety, and uh, two, the other two, um, one is for the friends and family of, um, of children, uh, 13 and over, and then the new one, which we've just added just because of the demand um, that we've recognized as well, is peer support for friends and family of children that are 12 and under. And that is basically based on uh, the book that our, one of our founders, uh, Dr. John Walker, had um, I made, it's called Coaching for Confidence. So that's Thank sort you. of one of my jobs, is to facilitate those support groups. Uh, we also offer two cognitive behavioral programs that is based on uh, the Anxiety Research uh, Center at St. E. And uh, we specifically deal with a panic disorder as well as social anxiety. Uh, we offer relaxation hours uh, for our page, um, um, participants, sorry. And uh, it just kind of teaches you relaxation uh, techniques such as breathing exercises, visualization, progressive muscle relaxation. That's a really popular one that's actually really easy to do. And we, um, we also have a really uh, wonderful uh, pet ther uh, therapist called Cookie. She's really okay. cute and she's very helpful. Um, we also offer individual peer support for people who have um, anxiety as well as their friends and family. So for those ones that are not quite ready to be in the group setting, we also offer those individual Great. peer support. Thanks, Kitana. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and next, we're going to talk to Dr. Cheryl Stern. And as I mentioned, Dr. Stern, um, her son lived with um, anxiety for many years and did not attend school for a long time. There were several years where he was unable to attend. And um, as I mentioned, though, it, in the end, he was able to graduate from his local high school thanks to a team effort, uh, which is really something to celebrate. Um, but one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, Cheryl, is that we know, and, I, and Dr. Unger certainly highlighted, that the early identification of mental health challenges is so critical, that so we can be proactive. But one of the challenges with anxiety in particular is that when it, it appears in early childhood, we saw the multifaceted aspects of it. It can be really difficult to identify and to pin down. So can you tell us about um, some of the challenges you and your child faced because the onset was so early and the difficulties with identifying it? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges was actually convincing people and even myself that children as young as three or four can be anxious. I mean, I would get comments like, what do you mean he's anxious? What's he got to be anxious about? He's three years old. There's, there's nothing to be anxious about. And not understanding, the, even though we couldn't understand what it was that made him anxious, he was. And just accepting something is making him anxious, something is stopping him from wanting to do all these activities that other kids want to do. And it's sufficiently enough that at, at points he couldn't go to school at all ages, seeing all the physical manifestations of it. And again, you know, you misinterpreted initially as being ill. So when he would go to school and he'd be throwing up, well, the school would call, he's got the flu, can't come and pick him up. And after a while, realizing my first question would be, does he have a fever? No, then he hasn't got the flu, it's his anxiety. And I'm trying not to pick him up and reward him. It took a long time for the school to come along with that, so they wanted him home immediately if he was throwing up. So trying to educate them, myself and him, as to when he was sick, when this was most of his anxiety, which was, I would say, his anxiety was 90% of the time. Um, so minimizing in the fact that, well, you know, he's just um, shy, you know, it's, you know, he wasn't. And we all, and I mean, I, I went along with it too, you know, mm -hmm. he's just shy, he's very clingy, or even how cute, it's so nice that he's, you know, little boy, but he still really loves his mom. No, no, it's not. <laughs> it really isn't. He shouldn't want his mom sitting beside him when he's five or six or seven or eight or nine or ten. Um, or then it would be switched to me, you know, well, he's your youngest, so 
you know, it's hard to cut the apron strings. No, I was very happy. I would have been ecstatic. I had a patient to see at 9 o'clock. I did not want to have to <laughs> spend my time with the bucket walking my son into school or, worse yet, taking him home. And I had to have a full-time at-home care because I never knew if he was ever going to make it to school or stay at school. So those were all the kinds of comments that we get. And, and I think if I had to summarize it, it would be a difficulty in believing that children that young can right. be anxious and recognizing that when it goes on for a period of time and it's associated with these physical symptoms, that that's what it is. Thank, thanks, Cheryl. And um, another kind of related issue is that you know we're really actively trying to reduce the stigma associated with mental health. But when your child doesn't go to school, you're often judged as a parent because one of your main jobs is to make sure your child goes to school. And words like truant and you know parents aren't engaged, they're, they're enabling, those kind of co comments are made. And so can you talk about how your experiences of sometimes being negatively judged as a parent interfered with kind of that proactive accessing of support? Yeah, I could say that I felt, felt a tremendous amount of pressure uh, from the school. And then you feel it from your son's friends, parents, and from your own family that A, the school would say that, again, anytime I took him home, it would be enabling behavior. Um, from other parents, it's would he, or your family, what do you mean he's not going to school? How are you letting him sit at home? I'm not letting him. I'm not encouraging him to sit at home. You tell me how I get him to school, short of physically throwing over, over my shoulder and bringing him there. And as they get older, you can't do that. Or I would get him to school, and he would walk into school, and I'd be happy. I'd drive off to work, and he'd leave You know, 15 minutes later. Or he'd go to his first class, and then he'd leave. But there was a lot of that, a lot of, you know, people phoning and saying, this is insane, you can't just leave him at home. If you have a suggestion, I'm all open to it, but I, I can't think of what to do. I don't know how to get him into school. So it was very difficult. People didn't believe that. And, and the other factor was when he'd come to school for a few days, because he was quiet and he kept care of himself, the teachers loved him in class, and people had a hard time believing that it was really anxiety. Well, he was in school all last week. What do you mean he's anxious? Why, what do you mean he can't come today? Mm -hmm. What's so special about today? And that was the other thing. And it, and it was also me kind of trying to understand. And to this day, I don't know why some days he could and some days he couldn't. And we tried to identify things in the school that might have set him off. And there were some things that we could identify that were difficult that we managed to adapt. But even when we made those adaptations, they'd work for a few days and something else or nothing else or just his anxiety would stop him from going. But you get, there is a huge judgmental factor and it's very hard to stay with your child and say, that's, it's not him, he's not a bad kid, he's not true, I don't, I'm not punishing him, I'm not enabling him, but I'm also not punishing him. Um, and I did the same, very much of that. You know, when you're at home, your job is to be in school. If you're at home, you're still doing your job, but it's very difficult if you're not at home, if you're a working parent and you don't have an option of taking time off, if you've got a caregiver who, you know, is a caregiver, but not necessarily an educator. Had, you know, it, it's difficult oh. to go through those things. And I, I was glad that you acknowledged the difficulty in trying to do that ideal set of things um, there. So Cheryl, um, having come out on the other side and actually getting your son to attend school, what advice would you give to parents who are facing this issue right now? Well, I think I, I would agree 100%. You cannot do this alone. You need to support, and you need multifaceted support. You need the school to be supportive and understanding and to under, understand about anxiety in general, or what supports the kids need in school. You need um, family and other parents and whatever to be understanding as well, so that, you know, a difficult thing for my son was when he showed back up at school was, where were you? And that's how we started off this. Mm -hmm. And how do you answer that? Helping them answer that as well. You know, I, I wasn't well enough to come to school, was what we kind of used as he got old enough to say that explained to the teachers not to make a big deal when he came back and to pat him on the back because he didn't want that attention. He just wanted to come back to school and just be in school and as, as, as unobtrusive as possible. You know, so those are some of the things. And, and Cheryl certainly spoke about when, when I shared with her what the title was, how apropos that was, and that when you get asked that question, where have you been, to the child who or student who's anxious, how much more anxious they become. So I guess a note to the teachers in the house, we have to not ask that question. Right, um, to our students. Thank you, Cheryl. So next we'll move to Laura Atea and Tammy Ortinsky. And I mentioned that they both uh, work in child and adolescent mental health through HSC, but they are teachers and, and they serve as liaisons. 
um, with uh, the interdivisional services through Winnipeg School Division. So um, certainly Dr. Under spoke about this, this need to collaborate, that we can't do it alone in schools. I mean, we feel sometimes as teachers we're on the front line and we're facing this issue, but uh, I think it's really good to know that there's help out there. And so um, the collaboration is so critical. Can you tell us, I guess we'll start with, with you first, Laura, can you talk to us a little bit about the supports you provide, not just for anxiety, but more generally for mental health and how they're accessed? Right, well, it, like you had mentioned, we are a liaison between families and the clinicians at Child and Adolescent Mental Health at Health Sciences Center and then the schools. So we get initiated by the clinic if a, if, um, a student is an, being seen by one of the teams uh, in the outpatient clinic there. And what happens is that once they've been interviewed and intaked by the mental health teams, they discuss with the parents and they do that interview piece that you were talking about to find out what are some of the issues with that child with mental health. So there, there's four clinics. We actually get most of our students are, um, from the anxiety services called ADSCI, Anxiety Disorder Service for Children and Youth. They used to be run out of St. B and then they move to health sciences and there's another about four or five other clinics there as well but we do get most of them from the anxiety service so it starts with that referral and then what we do from there like there's different information that the clinician has to fill in on that form to let us know what are the expectations of the family what are the expectations of the team what other team members are involved because usually it's one clinician from the team that will do the intake and so then it's up to us to contact them, get more information about the case, because they're not going to write everything down. And then after that initial meeting, we usually call the parents, and then we find out how can we support you and your child in the educational system. So that might be, and again, once you go through those interview questions and you talk about some background information and what's the child is experienced you know, with school, that's difficult for them is that could be in the form of just a phone call to the school to see what's going on and how they can support and they, you know, the, the school doesn't understand my child or I don't know if they understand that they have the anxiety. Can you, you know, kind of help us to get that across to the school? So it might even be like a larger meeting, like a school systems meeting, especially with the kids with school refusal. So when you had said that exposure hierarchy, coming up with a step plan, coming up with a specific plan that everybody's gonna to agree to, because most of the kids that are at school refusal are the older kids, even though we do, like you said, can be you know any age, right? You are, and so we service kids right from kindergarten to grade 12. And so then after that, it also could be a school observation because sometimes we will go into the schools because for the clinicians, for them to do their treatment and which sometimes is that medical, the medicine piece as well, they want to make correct diagnoses. So they'll have us go in, can you rule out this, rule out this, uh, and just to see pinpoint because obviously the way a child presents in a clinical environment is very different from how they present in a school environment. So that's our job is to go out to the schools. Thank you. And uh, Tammy, so that's sort of your, your general mental health supports. But when we think specifically about students with anxiety, one of our goals always is this, this idea of reintegration. And Dr. Unger spoke to that kind of that gradual exposure. Can you talk about how you might engage in that and support schools to reintegrate a student who's perhaps been away for a time? Absolutely. So definitely some of the ways that we provide support is through conversations with either the hospital staff, parents, um, the families, the school staff, and the students themselves at times. Um, and so it's essentially, as Dr. Unger said, doing that investigative work. Um, this helps us to obviously to provide that understanding uh, about what the students' needs are. And then once we know more about this, then we can then collaborate with the school staff and devise that plan, such as Laura said, that may include classroom adaptations or accommodations, things such as, like we said, shortening class times, reducing courses in a term, um, having alternate spaces to complete classwork, the use of headphones or music, extensions on assignments, those are all examples. 
Um, we also work to have the conversation about ensuring that there's a contact person at the school. This is really important um, that the student have identified somebody that they feel comfortable that they can go to when they're feeling, um, you know, that they need that support. So typically, um, but not limited to, um, could be guidance counselors or resource teachers. Those are typically who would be identified, but can be anyone else such as teacher, coach, et cetera. Um, again, to support that reintegration, we look at um, those step plans or gr gr um, graded exposure. Um, again, this allows for re-entry um, into the school gradually, um, again, with agreed upon steps that um, the student feels that they can um, you know, work at bit by bit. Some students may not return back to a regular classroom setting, um, but rather complete courses either online or through tutoring services or alternative programs. Thanks for sharing that. And um, because we've, you know, we've talked about the in increasing incidence of anxiety, I know that there's there's many school divisions and schools in uh, Winnipeg and Manitoba that are coming up with creative ways to address this issue, options for kids, some of like the ones you've just mentioned, Tammy. Can you talk about a program or two and what some of the outcomes have been like for some of these sort of innovative programs sure. directed towards anxiety? Yeah, definitely. There's programs across many of the divisions and um, when, within Winnipeg School Division, there's one identified as AMP, which is the Anxiety Management Program. It runs out of Kelvin High School. Now that one, while it's specifically targeting students with anxiety, there, are, like we said, there's many um, programs across a lot of the divisions that maybe aren't there targeting um, those students directly, but they will absolutely attest to the fact that students who struggle with anxiety end up in their programs. Um, so, Laura, I don't know if you want to... Um, add anything to that? Well, just again, like the off-campus programs you said, the mm -hmm. distance learning, like there's different, I know the Pemba de Trails have yes. that new one. There's the MET program, there's one, there's a Propel in one of the divisions where it looks more like that experiential learning, it's a work experience, it's not all just, you know, in the classroom at a desk. So they're just coming up with, you know, creative ways because they know that kids, you know, respond in, in different ways to different educational, you know, approaches. Great. Um, and so we know anything having to do with mental health is complex. Um, and certainly with the election that just passed, we know health care is top of mind. Um, and, and there are certainly shortages in the health care system, and in particular mental health. And so in your role, um, what do you see as some of the barriers going forward when students are experiencing anxiety or a mental health challenge in terms of accessing support or service? Um, well, I guess one of the things is that there's not always that, that psychoeducation piece out there for educators. So part of that and part of our role as well is that building capacity among educators to go out to schools to do presentations such as this. Um, we go out to do presentations for educational assistance through the Job Works program. We've been invited to a Borderland School Division this year. We had a partnership last year with Manitoba Education as well where Dr. Gary Altman from the Anxiety Clinic came out. So it's that psychoeducation piece. And, uh, and some, also some of the barriers too is, is that our education system as well, that K to 12 system and it, you have to have the credits, you have to have so many credits, everybody's expected to graduate at 18. That's a huge barrier because that puts so much anxiety on parents and on kids mm -hmm. that if I don't graduate when I'm 18 with my peers, then I'm a failure. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's kind of a, a barrier as well that we're, we're up against because we have to say, it's okay if you don't. You, you can stay in a public school till you are 21 years old. But, you know, that's, that's not the perception out there and that's not the belief that, that that's uh, unfortunately out, out there. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Did I you would just add, add that we know that um, support is not always there all the time. And sometimes, you know, some of these things like step plans can be quite... Um, you know, require a lot of support by um, others with that student. So, and sometimes those things aren't available. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And next we'll move to Dr. Grace Okasonia. Thanks, Grace, for joining us this evening. So, um, we've talked a lot about collaboration and support, but what are some of the things that parents, teachers, and communities can do, so collectively, to reduce the stigma associated with mental health and support the dignity and stability of students who are in our schools who may be grappling with this issue. Thank you. I really like the word dignity. And it is a very valuable word, knowing that these young people who suffer anxiety, they struggle. But at the same time, they are trying to respond as much as they could. Mm -hmm. Could just be one little step, 
at a time. But we need to realize that the context of whatever context we are going to create to help to break this, some of the barriers and also to, um, to help them to stay, at least to appreciate you know, the little steps they're taking and some of the recovery they're experiencing will have to be uh, things that help them to feel like they're valued as human beings. Mm -hmm. That being valued, dignity, that state of physical, emotional, spiritual comfort where an individual feels like I am valued for who I am, my uniqueness is valued, my individuality is valued. That is so very important. And that is something that one contest cannot work on completely. There is that need for that continuum of care mm -hmm. where from the child to the parents, to teachers, to um, janitorial staff, to the lunch lady, to everybody in the school. They just need to know that somebody is working very hard on something. Because what these students experience mostly, or what research will tell us, is that most of these students will be experiencing violation of their own dignity. For example, when other kids are rude to them, or when teachers are rude, or when people are very dismissive, like when they ask, where have you been? When this child has been working very hard, that is violation of their dignity. And we need all of that. Dignity is like the fuel for the well-being of every individual. So we need to understand that when they feel like they are valued as human beings, when they feel that like they are valued as the person they are and the person they are struggling, they are working very hard to be, they can, may not come to school. Some of them may stay back after lunch. Some of them may stay in the lunchroom. They don't want to come into the classroom. Mm -hmm but we need to recognize that they are working very hard to become somebody. That's why they are still in that environment. Mm -hmm. So helping them could mean breaking some of that barrier, mm -hmm. could mean allowing them to state what they need. Mm -hmm. It does not matter. It may not be rational to me. It may not be rational to you, but we are not walking through what they are walking through at that moment. Just allowing them a space where they could state what they need where they could create their own boundaries mm -hmm. to say, I don't want to talk to anybody. That is them, they are trying to create their own boundaries at that time. Allowing them to create that boundary without fear of losing value is Great. very important. So, so important to acknowledge those small steps. Just um, the small steps. Mm -hmm. And again, to utilize the naturalistic environment to promote engagement for all stakeholders. Great. All naturalistic environment because we already have clinical psychologists who are providing us um, the specialized care, uh, like the uh, gradual exposure, um, mm -hmm. all the wonderful things that Unga talked about. Yeah. Our role as school counselors or the role of the students we are training would be to provide that kind of well-being environment. I don't know that it does totally change, I would say, like some of the strategies that are out there that are used with, you know, children and youth, even adults, you know, would use as well. Um, yeah, I think we kind of heard examples of that over here with your experience being an adult and, and having that challenge with being at the university setting and, you know, working your way back in, into with your support, right? Going somewhere. Sorry. Um, I think as as children age, even older adolescents, and and moving into adulthood, it becomes increasingly important that that the strategies and the the goal be the person's, right? So it it working at tapping in what do they want out of their life, what are their values, and that fall and following that lead. Um, and them engaging in the strategies, not because they're implemented on them by the school or parents, but they're choosing them, right? So it becomes about what's motivating them and helping them to find that motivation and then linking them up with resources. And it's trickier, right? Like, because, you know, it's sometimes nice to have a full team of support around you to help you engage. And, and as an adult, now you have to choose, like you did, 
um, and, and take a lot more active role um, in your own recovery and your own well-being. Um, and, and even, but at the same time, the need, need for cheerleaders never stops. Like we need people to support well-being at every level um, across the age span and, and to be supportive and help people as they engage in those roles and still have that understanding of that they, I, I just really like the way you were talking about, you know, they're doing the best they can and they're working really hard and, and letting go of some of that blame language and talk that we can put on other people and, and come alongside them. I also believe that um, there is also need that you probably begin to normalize anxiety. Yeah, as a, a, a mo time. absolutely. Because yep. uh, in, in counseling, uh, again, we don't go deep into assessment and all of that. We believe that when a client comes in with an, a, an issue, you are just maybe providing some band aid, then you go on to give them skills. And after that, we are now working towards what we call third order change. This is when the, the client or that person will begin to integrate some of that and begin to become their own therapist. But the door of the therapist will remain open for them to come back when they need it. Yeah. So we begin to normalize it. And that's what our students do, the counseling psychologists, wherever they work, we work on growth of the, of, of the individual. So as our Counselors are providing services. They are modeling how to create relationship, healing re relationship. They are also modeling how to create healing environment. And over time, this person will begin to integrate it into their own life. And again, anxiety could happen at any time, right? Absolutely. Anxiety, it doesn't have to start in childhood. It could be like a 50-year-old and something happens. We had like, in, like anxiety skyrocketed during the 2008 uh, recession for adults, right? It's a big thing. But at, at a point, we have to normalize it as part of life. At the same time, we have to recognize it as a specialized um, condition that requires support. So as they are receiving specialized support, we are also providing well-being support. Thanks, Grace. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, I actually have a question for Cheryl. Um, what was the turning point when your child started being able to go to school more often, and what were some of the strategies that you used? So there was a couple of turning points. One was him realizing that he's not alone. So he went to MATC, and he was in a small group of kids that had anxiety. And seeing, as far as he was concerned, he was the only person in the world. You know, certainly his siblings, his family, or high achievers, sort of goal-oriented. So that was a huge step for him, is I'm, I'm not the only one. And in fact, realizing that he was one of those that could order the donut or whatever from, the, from Tim Hortons and other kids couldn't. In fact, there's kids worse than him. So that was a huge turning point for him psychologically. The second one was the graded response. And that was key to getting him back into the school, is going in the days that there was nobody there but the secretary, because for whatever reason, going in the summertime, and having him just go into the room, finding two things. One is a safe space for him to go to, where he could go and retreat to, and nobody was going to pull him out of that, no teacher was going to come after him and make him come back to class, etc. So knowing that he had that safe space was a little easier for him to go there. Then we graded it. He came in when just the teachers were there. Then he came in when they were writing exams. There were students there, but they were writing exams. All that was graded, as you said, to his fear. And, and, and each time he had to say, what was his fear level, three out of 10, six out of 10, et cetera. And then he was supposed to look at his own things. What helped? When did you start to feel less anxious? And what, what you know, so to recognize himself, what, what was making him less anxious. And the other pieces were, I think, having the resource room as a safe space that he know he could retreat to, even from a class where he was, so he didn't have to leave the school. I mean, before that, he was leaving the school, sometimes without a jacket, in the winter time, in dead of winter and texting me saying, I'm outside, I'm freezing cold, I don't know what to do. Because he was so scared that somebody would stop him and por force him back to class. Mm -hmm. So that safe space, and then having a, somebody that he identified as a safe person that he could go to as well. And then, in that particular case at Shaftesbury, it was the resource room and the resource person. who he got to know outside of school, anything to do with school. He just got to know him as a person, got to see with them, got to sit down with them, talk to him, etc. So he, this was a safe person who also wasn't going to put him back into class, force him to do anything he wasn't comfortable with doing. And it took a long time, but he eventually became quite comfortable in the school. He did his academic courses, which were always challenging for him online, in the school though, and at home. 
but mostly in the school in the resource room and he went to all of his non-academic like the shops classes or you know photography stuff he went there it started off with somebody coming with him to the empty again graded empty room just looking at the things where's the equipment that somebody might ask you to go and find etc meeting the teacher when no, no students there having somebody there with him just at the back of the class that he knew he was comfortable with that was kind of gave him that security that he could sit in the class there for the entire time and he but on his own, went from not going to school for over a year, barricading himself in his room literally with his dresser and whatever he could find so that I could not get into the room or nobody could get into the room to try and drag him out to school, to going voluntarily while I was at work going to school and showing up for all of those classes. So it was really a, quite a remarkable. I, I didn't think we'd get there, but we did. Hi, I'm just um, wondering about senior year students who are dealing with anxiety and when they reach that threshold of 18 years old. I know that there are some resources that are accessible to minors in the province that are different than what like additional supports that might be available for minors. And I'm just wondering if, if you are plugged into those resources, will they be able to stay with you if you're continuing high school past the age of 18? Or are you kind of forced to find uh, new um, connections and new places of support. Well, I know at the anxiety clinic, some students, they will still follow them when they are past 18, but not always. Sometimes they will have to transition to adult services. And I think that's sometimes, according to them, it, it, that's a little bit of a barrier. Because when adult services, well, you're with everybody 18 and over, whereas that to, like that, that age between maybe 18 and 25, I, I think that that's something that I have heard. I'm not, it's that that's always kind of difficult and I know some of the different associations are maybe trying to address that. So for the kids that just coming out of that. Thank you, Tana. At Anxiety Disorders Association of Manitoba, you cater to 18 and above, correct? Yeah. So our mandate, unfortunately, just um, uh, covers that, and, and that's for many different reasons. Safety is one of them. It's just it's the transition to accommodate 18 and under is just kind of quite difficult right now, so we haven't really figured that out, and I'm not sure if that's really going to change. Um, we do tell people uh, that, yes, once that you're a teen, you're able to access that, um, but I think that that's sort of where we're trying to kind of get to the bottom of it, that we're trying to educate the parents as well, too, um, that uh, that would be able to support them, the, the friends, the family, the educators, ECEs, anybody that would, you know, that would want to sort of uh, do that. But I just wanted to kind of quickly say just a little bit of the question as well too. Two things that I know make a difference for people is that when you give them self-determination and how the course of their recovery with anxiety or their journey with anxiety, whatever you want to call it, you empower them with that that is one huge motivation because they're not being forced to get out of the house, to go to school. You are telling them, you, we together as a team can self-determine how this is gonna go for you. So they don't feel trapped, they don't, you know, and that causes a lot of anxiety as well. And our job for those people that are supporting them is to create that safe, soft landing for them. And we need to hold space for them enough so that they can experience what they're experiencing, but we're still supporting them because it is kind of scary. It's very scary. And for us adults, and especially children, where you know, are dealing with our emotions, self-regulation is, I mean, some adults, I know adults that don't know how to self-regulate, my goodness, you know? And so if try to expect that out of a kid um, is really difficult. And so we need to be able to have that space for them as well, too. Well, well said. Do we have one more question? I know we're going over time. I'm respectful of the time, but uh, Joanna, did you? Yeah. Um, thank you very much for uh, this interesting discussion. Um, this uh, question is um, for Dr. Unger. You had talked about uh, mental illness as a whole and that depression was the number one mental illness in the past. Now it's anxiety. Oh, that was uh, Nadine. Oh, Nadine, in university. Yeah, and so with anxiety right now, um, what is causing that in your estimation? I guess I would throw that out to the whole panel. What is causing this as a major issue for mental health today in our times? I, I, can, I can start. I, I don't know that I have a great answer, so I'll look to my fellow panelists for that as well. Um, one of the things that um, is a little bit important to remember is just as you were talking about how anxiety is, is normal, it's a normal uh, emotion reaction that we all have, 
uh, one contributing factor is, is um, that anxiety is actually adaptive. So if you think about um, uh, people who are free of anxiety and people who have anxiety, and you put them in a situation that looks potentially unsafe, who's more likely to survive? The person who's anxious. Anxiety and worry is actually supposed to keep us safe. Like that's its purpose, right? And we all have anxiety, we all have fear, and its purpose is to keep us safe. So, um, you know, evolutionarily, as we as we continue to develop, the people who survive are the people maybe who are a little bit less the risk takers, right? And so over time, we we kind of it's a, it's an adaptive for survival emotion that maybe we've over, uh, you know, overdeveloped uh, as a society. There's other factors. That's just one. Uh, if someone else wants to jump in on others. Maybe I'll, I'll jump in, because yeah. one thing we, we haven't talked about, and I'll talk this quickly, is about the role of technology and social media. And um, th there was an interesting study recently looking at people on their phones, and when you're being texted to, and you see the bubbles start appearing, and you know that someone's, how people's anxiety actually goes up, not to a clinical level, but when they're waiting, and you know they might be really disappointed because maybe someone just left it open. They didn't actually type something. Um, but that's just one example. A second, on Anderson Cooper, uh, there was a study being done about anxiety, and um, they took Anderson's phone away from him and specifically started texting him repeatedly. And he couldn't look at his phone. And he was wearing one of the, it's galvanic skin response to measure stress. And his stress level was going up exponentially because his phone was beside him, but he couldn't check it. So when we think of our students and our, our children and this, this role that anxiety and always being on plays, we can't help but look at the connections um, between that and anxiety and making us just more anxious. Um, well, and, so. the, and there's the overperform the perfectionism factor and, and our culture of, of working very, very hard, right? Our culture is one that, that um, motive is rewards hard work, right? How are you? Busy. That's the, right? <laughs> you know, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. Well, what, what if we just said, oh, I'm good, or life is really relaxing right now. Like people don't, <laughs> I'm just having chill time, right? And, and, um, um, and, and maybe this is changing generationally. This might be a little bit old school, and hopefully our, our next generation coming up are a little bit more relaxed than we are. Uh, but there's, there's a culture of working overtime, of working harder, working faster, working better, working more um, that has been there, and that increases stress and, and contributes to higher levels of anxiety. Social media is a huge one. Uh, contributing factors to that, or, or just being on, technology being on, we agree with that. If I can make a quick comment, coming from a medical background in an environment which is very competitive, very high stress oriented, um, part of two is you see people's successes, and the kids these days much more so than yeah. my generation, it's in your face, it's on every Instagram, nobody puts up their, their failures, nobody nope. tells you about <laughs> yeah. the, the lousy meal they ate, but I got to see the coffee that they had that had the beautiful heart in it, or I see the wonderful place that they went to, or everything they did, and I think I'm seeing it in the medical students and the, and the residents that we teach, a higher level of anxiety too, and that performance because it's out there and in your face, and you feel you're not up to that. And I used to have this thing that my kids hated on my fridge that said, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but Babe Ruth hit a thousand whatever home runs, but he struck out three thousand times. Well, whoever knew how many times Babe Ruth struck out because nobody advertised that, but more so, take that a thousand times more now where everybody's success is out there in your face, either in writing mm -hmm. or in a picture yep. there. And these kids are facing that. And when it's, acad whether it's academic anxiety or et cetera, mm -hmm. it hits you. And, and it's hard to ignore it. Whereas before, in my generation, I didn't know how the next kid did yeah. unless they told me and I wasn't interested. And then I could walk away. <laughs> <laughs> you can't walk away from it yeah. now. Uh, good point. And, and the great concluding words, I think, for our panel. So clearly, we've just scratched the surface of this very important issue. So thank you for your patience. I'm going to call on Dr. Manzik now, Dean Manzik, to uh, say our